Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cielo Vista Church Online. So delighted to have you a part of our service today. For the next few moments, I want to speak with you about engaging the culture as, as a believer in Christ. Because of the culture's growing hatred for Christians, some questions, I believe, surface. At least I've been asking these, like, uh, what's the future of the Christian faith going to look like? What's going to happen to the Christian church worldwide? How many Christ followers will bow to the God of tolerance for all because of the pressure to conform? It'll become too much. How many won't bow? Will some claim allegiance to Christ while at the very same time seek safety in the culture's acceptance? How many will be bold yet loving and have the stamina to endure the backlash of holding to a biblical world view? It's already happening. The window of religious freedom is closing. I, I hope you know that and, and, and you're aware of that. Just look around. You can tell uh, every, everything is tolerable except biblical Christianity. And a whole lot of acclaimed Christ followers kind of yawn their way through stories about like this. And this is not the time to yawn or even back down because of intimidation. Here's a, here's a cluster of oddities for Christians. Now, for example, we are told to love a culture whose hatred for Jesus and his followers is growing exponentially. Another one is we are to speak biblical truth to a culture that worships individual freedom and abhors those who claim any level of moral absolute from the Word of God. The Bible is God's number one big seller, and it is a moral absolute book on what is wise and what is unwise about relationships, lives, all kinds of things. Another oddity is we are to tell the culture that all have sinned, which results in eternal punishment from a holy God. We're to do that with compassion. Another one is we have been given the mandate to fan out all over the globe the life-changing message of hope, to a culture that views the Christian message as irrelevant. This is not an easy time to uphold the eternal, unchanging message of Jesus Christ, but it is the right time. In God's divine will and sovereignty, he chose you, chose me, to be a part of this slice of history for a reason. God has us alive today for a reason. This is not a mistake that our church family, Cielo Vista Church, gets the privilege and the opportunity to be a witness for Jesus Christ in this community. Now, if you're watching this in another community, God has chosen you to be a part of that community, to be a witness for Him. Church history is replete with men and women who were Christian zealots in the face of cultural ridicule and persecution. And yet they were unfazed and did their work they were assigned to do from God with love and an unwavering boldness, striking the balance of loving all people and yet holding to an unwavering stance on biblical convictions. It wasn't easy then. It's not easy today. And I will tell you this, it is a balancing act that non-Christians will never understand. When I was growing up, I would hear older Christians, older Christ followers say this in our church, feel so good to be a Christian nation. When I was a kid, I heard that. I hear that statement on occasion every once in a while. And today when I hear it, I say to myself, I don't think we are. I don't, I don't think we're a Christian nation. I think we had Christian foundation, but today, 2020, uh, I, I don't. I would not call our. I would not. I would not call our nation a Christian nation. And then a popular statement was thrown around that says, "Well, we're a post-Christian nation. Post meaning after. Well, we're not a Christian nation, and we're not a post-Christian nation. Uh, it's my personal conviction today, after reading, observing." listening to the, what the culture has to say about 
Christianity, I would say that we are a anti-Christian nation. Political correctness has washed out biblical correctness a long time ago. Now, I don't want us to throw a pity party. This is not a time to throw a pity party. I don't like going to pity parties. You don't like going to pity parties. And it's not a time for a pity party. We're not, we're not the first culture to face hate. Uh, minority status would be viewed as irrelevant in the eyes of the culture. If you're taking notes today, write this phrase down, short phrase. Cultures change, God doesn't. In fact, we'll say this, God's word is unchanging in a changing world. In the upper room, the Last Supper, Jesus was preparing the remaining 11 disciples for their future ministry after he was gone. And Jesus foretold the events on his physical departure from this world. He urged the disciples, he urged them to draw close to God's care and draw close in love to one another. He told his disciples how to, how to love one another. Here's what he said in John chapter 15, verse 16 and 17. He said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. This is what he said. Jesus said, love one another. And then the atmosphere changed with a real heavy dose of reality of what was ahead for these men. In John chapter 15, verse 18, he says, if, or in other words, the phrase is this, because. You read it like this. John 15, verse 18, because the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, they will naturally, they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. Wow, what profound words Jesus said. Don't, don't, and don't, don't look for the acceptance of the culture. Don't look for the culture to applaud you and me and say, oh, how wonderful, you're a Christ follower. You believe in moral absolutes. You believe in that God's word oversees all the culture's words. Well, there's an anti-Christ sentiment that is expanded rapidly in our culture. The culture that scrubs itself of Christianity does so with hatred as, as in a way of persecution. I sometimes hear Christians say they're not getting a fair treatment in the culture and that there is a double standard in the culture. Well, of course there's a double standard. There's always been a double standard. Don't, don't throw the pity party and say, well, we're, we're, I, there, there's a double standard by that group. Of course there's a double standard. The reason you might be persecuted and the reason I might be persecuted is because we are not of this world. The Bible says we are we're passing through. Revert back to Jesus' words, because the world or the culture hates me, Jesus said. It's not uncommon to be flying and have the captain address the passengers with a warning of severe turbulence that uh, it's going to get rough. No one on the plane mumbles to the other passengers such as, well, what a negative pilot. Where's the positivity? I wish he or she would just leave us alone and let us enjoy the flight. Man, I've been on flights where there's suddenly an announcement for the flight attendants to take their seats. What does that mean? That means it's going to get rough. Warnings are designed to inform. What, what's this message about today? A lot of it, it's, it's a warning. Prepare yourself. Be aware. Uh, warnings are designed to inform so that people can get ready. Adjust yourself. Be prepared. Uh, the seasoned trailblazer, the Apostle Paul, wrote to his understudy, Timothy, about ministry turbulence. It was a warning in order to prepare people not to live in confusion about the times. Uh, I, I want it from God's word today. Say, hey, let's not be confused about the times we're living in. It's going to get rough. Well, the Apostle Paul's second letter to Timothy, if we were to read that about ministry turbulence today or life turbulence, we'd say, well, that's what he's talking about today. It's so relevant. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 5 says, You should know this, Timothy, 
that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money, and they'll be boastful of proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Does that sound like today? Verse 3 says, they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Verse 5 says, "They they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. He said, stay away from people like that. Uh, there are 19 different warning signs about turbulence. I mean, you just get straight to the point. Lovers of self, that's narcissism. Lover of money, driven by greed. Boastful, seeking glory for self. Proud, exalted above others. Scoffing at God, that's a blasphemer. Disobedient to parents, rejects counsel. Ungrateful and unthankful attitude. Nothing is sacred, reject the eternal laws unloving, hard-heartedness, unforgiving, refuses to forgive offenses, slanderers, what is that? Malicious talk and behavior, self-control, no self-control, that means no ability to be ethical, cruel, opposite of gentle, hate good, identifies with corruption, uh, betrays friends, betrays for selfish gain, Reckless people that harm people without thinking. That's happening all the time in our culture. Uh, Prideful views self above everything else. Pleasures over God. Desires pleasure more than God. Acts religious. Those are pretenders. They act hypocritical. Uh, what, What have faithful followers of Christ done in good times and in hard times? Uh, They've remained faithful to God regardless of the demands because the message of the church is enduring. Well, what do we do now? We pray for persecuted Christians to be unwavering in the threat of agony. Uh, There are persecuted Christians all over the world. It hasn't come here yet. Uh, Let me me just tell you, when when churches get together and they serve coffee, uh, persecution is not having your coffee just like you like it. That's not persecution. Uh, Persecution is not someone got your seat, your seat. Uh, Persecution is not having to wait to get off the parking lot. American Christianity really doesn't know what deep persecution is, but I would encourage us to pray for around the world for those who are persecuted. So I I don't know any persecuted Christians. I'll tell you what you could do. We could pray God Uh, Help those who are enduring persecution today, those who are being threatened with their life because they're followers of you. Pray for persecuted Christians. We can be intentional to insulate our children with biblical truth. Tell them why truth matters. Uh, One of the things we've said in our church many times is when people, often you share your faith or you say, I I don't live, I don't want to partake of that. I'm going to live differently. It's very common for other people to say, you just think you're better than I am. And what we've said in our church is this, I don't think I'm better than you. I'm just different. My worldview is different. I think differently. I I have different values. I, I read different things than you read, perhaps. I want to talk a different way. I'm not better than you. I'm just different than you. I have no, I'm not better than you at all. Uh, as paganism matures, and it will. Hey, hey friend, I don't, I don't know where you're watching this at, but I want to tell you something. Paganism is going to mature. It's going to grow. It's vital for Christ followers to have the depth to converse about worldviews without arrogance. We don't, when we talk about truth, we don't have to put people down. Uh, when you look at someone, regardless of how they live, how they think, they could be atheistic, some lifestyle that, you know, you're going, that's not me. Uh, it may not be you. It may be them. doesn't make what they're doing right because it may be in a violation of God's living word. But I will tell you this. Know that every person you see, regardless of how they live, regardless of how they talk, regardless of how they think, they are a person for whom Christ died. Uh, I, I, would, I would encourage you today, know what you believe and know why you believe it. As, 
as we study the Word of God, God's Word should not make us more arrogant. It should make us more loving with those whom we live around. The last thing is this. Pray for your church. If you go to Seattle Vista Church, pray for this church. Wherever you call church your home, pray for other churches as well. I'm not going to take time to list the churches in our community, but when I go by a, a churches uh, that, are, that uh, are in other parts of our city, I say, God, give, give that church hope. Give the leaders wisdom. Give them encouragement. Let them reach people perhaps that Seattle Vista Church will never reach. And I would say this, we're pulling on the same end of the rope. I one time I had a guy come to my church and he said, hey, I noticed a church, this church named, named, named it. And he says, that's your competition. I said, no, they're not. Other churches who preach and teach the word of God, they're not, they're not our competition. I only have one enemy, that is the evil one. And so I want to encourage you, wherever you live, get in the habit of praying for Bible teaching, Christ exalting churches when you go by that church. Maybe you're at a light. Stop and just pray for that church. Pray for the leadership of that church. We don't need less churches proclaiming the truth. We need more churches accurately proclaiming the truth. So let's be a church family, ready to receive new people with love, and, and they come to this church whenever we get back together and drink from the endless supply of God's hope and grace and forgiveness. Let's go public for the one who gave his life for us. Jesus said that the best time to shine the brightest is when things are the darkest. And I mean, things are dark these days. So guess what? This is an opportunity to let our light shine for Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 says, Jesus said, you're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Let your light shine. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Don't we, we don't stand on the shore of fear, of paganism. We don't stand on the shore of what are we going to do next as a church. We don't stand on the shore of hopelessness. We stand on the vast shore of God's mercy that is available to all, for all people. So maybe if you're discouraged, maybe you watch the news and you watch the news and you watch the news and people say, well, have you heard about? They'll fill in the blank of what's taking place in the news. You've lost your vision for the future. You've lost your vision for others. You've lost your vision for evangelism. You've lost your vision for God doing great things in and through your life, your family, wherever you are, single, married. I just say, get your vision back, get your trust back, get your courage back, get your purpose back, and engage people in the love and even boldness in the name of Jesus. Don't back down. Don't retreat. Don't capitulate. Go forward and onward in the power and the peace of the living God. The culture changes all the time. God and His Word will never change. Be bold, be loving, be kind, be gracious, be forgiving. Know what you believe and why you believe it from God's number one big bestseller, the Word of the Living God. Thank you for watching today. Let me pray for us before we go. Father, thank you for everyone watching. I thank you that you have given us your counsel called the Bible. As we live in a culture that is growing more and more paganistic, may we be more and more in love with you, more bold for you, more kind and gracious and tender for you to those whom we come in contact with. In Jesus' beautiful name, his enduring name, amen. God bless you as you go through your week. Thank you for watching today. Remember this, God before us, who could ever be against us? Thank you for watching. Bless you this day.